everybody. Welcome to Where the Rubber Meets the Road. This is Jeff Abiad, and I am so excited about our inaugural episode. You know them, you love them. Pastor Bill and Lisa Schuler are currently on their way down to the C3 garage, and we're going to get to take a look under the hood of their lives, hear some of their life stories. It's going to be amazing. Remember, you can catch all of these in person. If you come to C3 on Tuesday nights, we have five of these weeks planned for the summer. We'll see what happens after that. But you can find our schedule online at capitallife.org slash C3. All right, let's not waste any time. We'll get right to it. Sit back, relax, enjoy this episode of Where the Rubber Meets the Road. The very first thing that I want to do, besides welcoming you to the C3 Garage, here we are. Thank you for that. If you're listening yes. to this, you can use your imagination. Yes. And uh, just give you a chance to say uh, who you are and what your role is here at the church. Sure. Well, uh, I'm Pastor Bill Schuler, and uh, and I'm Lisa Schuler. <laughs> yes. And so we're the founding pastors of Capital Life Church. And there was a church in this building before we came in that ended up merging and coming in underneath Capital Life. So this building actually has had a, a church in it for, oh, since 1961. But we came in in 2013. Yeah. So Capital Life is younger than the building is. But the building is now Capital Life, uh, you know, and of course we are the church, but meaning all of us. But, but yeah, the building is that old. So you're um, you're younger than the building. Thank you for that. Oh snap! <laughs> Don't do the math. <laughs> Don't do the math on that one. It was one. built in 1985. Yes. No, I didn't exactly. know. And so that's right. And, uh, thank you. And the, and, um, and it is, you know, it is. Uh, well, we are uh, the lead pastors, and uh, I'm the primary uh, preaching pastor. And so, uh, and chairman of the board, but we have a wonderful board out of the church and we can tell more about that if it gets to that. Yeah. So Lisa, you can talk about what your role is, but I actually think it'd be really unique also to hear like, I mean, obviously you two are married, <laughs> your, your evolution into what your role is now, because I know we started together. I moved out here in whenever it was, 07. Right. Everybody's exactly. job has changed quite a bit <laughs> since then. No, yeah. it's true. So I think that I've kind of done a little bit of everything for a lot of years. Yeah. So um, when the girls were really little, I used to do the finances <laughs> and I never got put in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happened. I had made, I made sure we paid very big bucks for some really good, um, you know, accountants to double check everything yeah. after I did all the details. I was probably the best accountant we ever had outside of Vivian. <laughs> You were invested. I was so scared. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> I made sure everything was detailed. I also, scary but true, I studied music in college, right? But I also ended up becoming the worship leader for a time. And that was also while I was doing accounting. So I was, I, I just was not in my element, okay? I do not know when to come in or when to exit. When it comes to music, I just can sing, right? That's it. When you studied it music, what did you think you were going to do? I thought that I was going to be a singer, like, like worship travel ministry? around oh, sure. and do concerts and be like Amy Grant. I would love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. It didn't happen because I can't remember the words to songs. <laughs> I, you know, whatever. It was just, it's what I studied. It's what I loved. And I do still love music. I just am not a worship leader. So we did have, we did have one moment. Um, and I remember this. We had been in a number of different buildings and different locations <laughs> before we finally came to what now is ours and with this building and the property next door. And, uh, but back when we were in a place called the Old Lyceum, which is in Old Town Alexandria, uh, at, and we had 13, no, 12 parking spaces. That's it. But we had 100 and some people in the church, which means that every Sunday we'd have a 13th parking per, a person park, and we had to go find them because nobody could get out of the parking lot. But I remember that we had a worship leader by the name of Brannon back then. And then Brannon, that was our very first worship leader. And when he left, he left us with tracks. And like music tracks, not music. Bible tracks. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly right. And 
Whereas Pastor Jeff would do great with that, uh, meaning, you know, he thinks in terms of, okay, after the seventh thing, then you come in with a different line that you're singing. Unless you're used to this, and this was put on Lisa last minute, it can be a train wreck. And I remember one time when it was a train wreck, and and Lisa went on, I think, with what was being Oh, she thought the line went one more time, but it repeated, went to something you know, else. Like it's a bridge, and it's going over and over and Church over. Church songs never do that. No, yeah. and so <clears throat> I didn't know when to stop or when to get off that train. And so finally, I just was like, I'm so lost on the song. I just started dancing, and so that was the end of <laughs> that worship. everybody was laughing and enjoying it, and it's one of the most nightmare. memorable services we ever had because people enjoyed yeah, the train wreck, but you're welcome. So I, I did step out of that role. Then I eventually, you know, did a lot of administration and helping with um, a lot of what Julie does now, I used to do all of that and women's ministry and life group um, oversight and missions oversight and outreach. So I kind of was doing a lot of things that I became good at it because when you do something long enough, you just do it. And I loved people, so I could yeah. just keep doing that. But it was stressful. And so when we brought Dr. Julie on, it gave me the freedom to be able to really do what I love, which is women's ministry and that's where we've where we've landed. And I still of course help on the board and I help anything that Bill needs as not only my husband but as the pastor and with the executive team and you know just any way that I can encourage people. So, so I still sort of do all those things. I wonder, are there any PKs that are here? Okay, so we have a PK. Pastor or evangelist or a pastor. So yeah, we're both PKs. And when you launch a work, you do everything. And Lisa, being the daughter of a pastor, used to clean the toilets and go out and lead the worship. Oh, I so did the accounting like then, every, too, so I experienced. Yeah, yeah, every element of <laughs> what in happens in the church. Yeah, I still never went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here. Room. This is more of a practical dream question. I want to ask the both of you. Now, this is unique because you are both answering, but you might have your own opinions here, or maybe the same. What is your dream vehicle? Because we're going to go on a journey here, and we're going to be in your dream ride. So for this trip, what are you going to be driving? So Pastor Bill, I'm going to oh. Okay, now think first. of it, and let's see if we have the same one. Oh, we definitely won't, because oh. there's <laughs> nothing in my brain. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but there should be. I know. I think, honestly, a Land Cruiser. We had one at one oh, point. Oh, I do it like Land Cruiser. It was so solid and re, uh, reliable. What is that, a Toyota? Land yeah. Cruiser, yeah, Toyota. And then we sold it for cash, and I think it went to Afghanistan to be used in military maneuvers or something. I don't know. <laughs> honestly, it might have been. It's anointed. Yeah, yes. It was, they were needing it for something. It was a reliable, solid deal. And so I would say Land Cruiser, although there are those shiny cars that you like that are in movies and everything, they're not realistic. I thought you were going to say a red Honda Prelude. I know. That was <laughs> yeah. my first car. I was, was so proud one of. Dream. Actually, we're not much of car people. Like, I just want to make sure that I'm not on the side of the road somewhere and it's not beat up. I just want a nice car that's good and clean and that's not what a Land Cruiser is. breaking down. <laughs> okay. But we didn't get a Land Cruiser this time around because that one was a used one. We got it for such a good price and now it's in Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so this is something new okay. that we're starting this week now that we're recording, which is we're going to start the engine. So okay. what I want you guys to do is give me the best impression oh, no. of the engine of your car. <laughs> oh, right now? Yeah. I am. <laughs> it's it's electric. Yeah. <laughs> It's just smooth riding. I mean, I don't hear the engine. Vroom! Yeah, the perfect. There we go. Okay. That's I know what you're wanting. Vroom, 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 vroom. There yeah, it okay, is. That's going to be the clip. It's yeah. just yeah. a sequoia. It's nothing impressive. One. Yeah, that's right. That'll be the intro for every one of these. Yeah. Pastor going vroom, vroom. The reason, actually, I was thinking about starting your engine as just a starting point is I wanted to talk about where your faith began. Mm. Um, and for each of you, that's going to be at a different place. But where did your faith journey start? So here we are right now in the lower level of the church with vacation Bible school having happened right here. And that's how I came to Christ was through a vacation Bible school. And it was the Baptists. 
uh, having this going, and my mom said, you need to go. So I went, I heard the gospel, came back, told my mom about it. We took a trip somewhere around Malibu, California. We were in the vehicle. I was in the back seat with my brother, and I told my mom about all that I was learning, and that's when she said, would you like to make a decision in regard to everything that you've heard? Because it's one thing to hear about Jesus. It's another thing to decide, I want to give my life to Jesus. I said, I do want to do that. So she said, why don't you get down on your knees? I, so somewhere in, in California, going 65 miles per hour, or whatever the speed limit was, that's when I accepted Jesus. And that was at a very young age. And people say, well, it can't take at that young age. It absolutely took. Mm. And of course, intellectually, I learned more about Christ and sparred with the claims of Christ and all these things, you know, in the years ahead and, and received Christ intellectually yeah. as I went along. But for me as a child, I understand, you know, accepting uh, God and Jesus who died on the cross and rose from the dead as a childlike faith, because that's all I had. And uh, so that's how I came into the faith. But my Dad was an evangelist, and my mom had been in public relations for, uh, and some of you will, might know these people, Bob Pierce uh, was the founder of World Vision. I don't know if you've heard of World Vision. My mom was the personal assistant to Bob Pierce, and then she worked for Billy Graham in New York City at his largest crusade that he had done up to that point in, this, in the United States and really in the rest of his career. It was huge. It was in Madison Square Garden and, and Shea Stadium, I think it was. Yeah. And then, uh, and so, uh, so my mom did those things. And then on another side of things, some people may know who Catherine Kuhlman is. My mom was Catherine Kuhlman's personal assistant. So it was very interesting that my mom had been in ministry, my dad had been in ministry. Uh, and so I grew up in that type of family, but there was that unique moment where you realize you're all right, you're there, you know that by what your family is yeah. and what they do, but you make a decision for yourself. And that was, uh, the vacation Bible school. I'm always interested me. too, in the variety of backgrounds. Cause my parents too come from like a divergent background yeah. of faith experiences. Yeah. And how did your parents, you know, I mean, I know you didn't know your dad, yeah. but how did they find each other in that place? Cause now your faith is kind of a combination of those two mm -hmm. things plus... Yeah, I think it's the, my mom would have been aware of my dad through having worked for Billy Graham. Mm. And uh, dad was second only to Billy Graham with the crowds that he was bringing in. So that we're talking about, they'd put up a big tent and you could get twelve to 14,000 people under the tent. Then they went into uh, civic auditoriums. Then they went into stadiums. And so they were breaking records at Soldier Field in Chicago and other places by the amount of people that would take every seat. There wouldn't be an empty seat in yeah. those days. And there was an organization by the name of Youth for Christ, and they were both main speakers for Youth for Christ. And so that's another era, but it was right after World War II, and people had lost loved ones in the war, mm. and they wanted to talk about God, and they wanted to know if there was any hope uh, when you draw your last breath on this earth. Right. So people like Billy Graham and my father and about three or four others were crisscrossing the nation and sharing about Jesus and bringing people to Jesus. So, yeah. so uh, that's how she must have learned who he was and been connected to him. <clears throat> and also through her work with Bob Pierce and World Vision, because Bob Pierce is one of my dad's best friends. But then her her emergence into Catherine Kuhlman and more the what we would call the spirit-filled realm. Sure. Uh, that was a whole unique thing, but she grew up in Amy Simple McPherson's church, Angelus Temple in Los Angeles. Yeah. So now we're talking about uh, a realm that believes that the miracles we read about 2,000 years ago did not just launch the church, they can happen today. And so in my uh, big seminary word theology, you know, in, in my understanding of God and, and the scriptures and everything, I believe that we hold to the word of God. That is the ultimate authority. If anything goes against the word of God, reject it. If it's the word of God, embrace it. That is eternal and that is life. But there's the side that also believes that we can experience this in the now that we can pray for someone and we can see healing happen, yeah. uh, emotional and in body and other things. And so those two, two things coming together, you never just go experiential, you'll get in trouble. But if you're only standing on the word of God and not experiencing something in the now, you're missing something. Mm. So when we bring those two things together, that's where the power is and that's where the relationship is. And Definitely. So. 
Yeah, how about you, Lisa? So my parents, um, there are five kids in our family, and they were the first um, Teen Challenge home for girls out of San Francisco. So we lived in Northern California. Yeah. And I was really tiny at the time. And um, I just remember, you know, these girls are coming off the streets. They're some prostitutes, drug addicts, really hardcore lifestyles that they're coming into out your of. house, into our home living. We had a, a into like your a, room. <laughs> well, There's we had stories, like a dormitory yeah. built out so that all the women could stay in there. And my yeah. sisters were out there, too. And I remember sleeping in the room with them and praying over them and praying for them as a little girl. But wow. before that, I was just four. And I remember um, saying to my mom, it's uh, my mom too, you know, that I wanted to ask Jesus into my heart. Yeah. And I think it was just always understood because growing up in a Christian home, we just always knew about Jesus and going to church and all of those things and being involved in ministry. And so I remember kneeling down in the living room and praying, you know, with my hands like this. And yeah. I can picture the red little love seat or whatever it was. Yeah. And yeah, that was the start. And I think, you know, I think that I kind of ha went on a journey of a little bit of a more of a performance kind of legalistic route of growing up um, in a Christian family, but not really having that relationship with Jesus where I wanted to study the Word of God, I wanted to know the Word of God and and love, you know, His Word. And that actually came later for me. I think I always loved Jesus. I always, you know, I wasn't ever a rebel or doing anything outside of the, you know, church. I think of anything, it was the opposite where I was just really rigid and, like, legalistic. Sure. So I think for me the freedom and grace coming was a complete turnaround for me to understand, wow, Jesus really does set you free. You don't have to be like bound up in some kind of performance to love Jesus. Do you feel like mm -hmm. there's a hinge moment growing up that really stands out to you as something that helped you realize that, oh, God is real here now in my life? Actually, it was in college, yeah. believe it or not. And I was in ministry. Like, you know, I was actually singing around the world and doing concerts in You're those doing days. It. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. living the dream. Um, but I I remember sitting, I, I actually had come to a place in my life where I literally said, I think I could do this on my own. Like, you just live by a certain principle in life where you're kind to others, you're good, you do right things. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what the difference is with or without God, which is so ironic growing up in a whole, you know, family ministry and knowing Jesus and all that. But I hadn't really read the Bible by choice. It was just kind of like whatever happened that came into my life through church or whatever, then that's what I would absorb through the Bible. So I was really growing up learning the principles of God, not knowing the word of God, which is such a kind of empty thing. Mm -hmm. And so I tried it out and it didn't last very long. I bet not. Yeah. Every time that I, you know, people would come to me and, and I, that was kind of like, I, I became this place where it was a safe person to talk to amongst my friends. And I just felt like everything that I would say just would hit flat. Like I just felt like I had no wisdom. I felt empty inside. It was kind of basically, I think now as an adult looking back, I think I basically hit a wall of depression mm -hmm. in my life where I was just depressed. And so I remember being in the in the car taking this long trip and we were going through Kansas and there was just a bump every 50 yards that your car hits over and we were driving across the whole country moving to Oklahoma at the time and I remember just saying God forgive me. I mm. am so empty without you as the guide. So yeah. that was the turnaround for me was just recognizing yeah, you really can't do it on your own. Yeah. It's not just the principles of God that work. Yeah. It's actually he is the one who sets you free and gives yeah. you life and joy and peace and all the things. So. Yeah, I think we all come to a place where we have to... We were talking about it last night, watching The Chosen, and just getting to a place where you have to make it your own thing. Mm -hmm. It can't just be rules that you're following or exactly. your things family's... that you believe, yet your family yep. believes. Yeah, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I, it's funny that you landed back in a car. Yeah, takes true. Us, takes us right yeah. back. Yeah, there you go. Right. Here we are. Where the rubber meets the road. Look at you're right. so ready. Uh, I want to talk about who's in your car with you. So let's talk about like I know you have three daughters and now mm -hmm. a son-in-law. Well, who's in your journey with you? And I, obviously you have your family too. But who's your inner circle of people? It begins with the family. With that thought, when we think of moving out here to the Washington D.C. 
metro area. And our first full day in our home was September 1, 2001. And we all know what happened on 9-11 just, you know, 10, 11 days later there. So we had one daughter that was two years old and another that was, what, four and six, I think, or something like that. And so uh, that God would ever launch you into some big, new, huge deal and make you leave where you are in the comfort of where you are and all the people you know to some place you don't know while you're juggling three children at the same time and and trying to keep the family together, and they're so young and so dependent upon you. And God just made it fit in so many ways. There's so many stories there. But... uh, But yes, the family unit is so vital. I know a lot of people who end up being very accomplished. They have the wow factor in what they do in life by their job description and title, and they don't have the family thing right. And so I was determined, and Lisa was determined, that we would not lose our children in the midst of Mm -hmm. building a ministry because we have too many stories out there of of children resent the, the parents, even though here, look at this wow ministry. And so uh, we chose to to do it right where they're concerned. And that's where, you know, I think of who's in the vehicle with you would definitely be that. Now, of course, we have our executive team, Pastor Jeff's on that, and and uh, Pastor Andy a moment ago somewhere, and then Pastor Julie and others are on that team uh, with us. And we have a brand new member of the executive team that was starting on July 1st, which is Josh Queen, who's back there doing the all the sound and everything, he will now be taking a full time role with us, which is great. We just expanded, we just grew. Praise God! Yeah, I'm and so um, but that's but that's the team that it, we have around us, and then of course we have an outstanding leadership team, and uh, some of whom are in this room, Amanda, and so we have people that are dedicated, that are called to the mission. And to everything we've set our hands to, as long as God has that calling there, we're going to be faithful to it. And it's been now 20 years as a church and 21 years of being out here. Yeah. And so so that's who I think of. Now, if, of course, everybody can't fit in that vehicle <laughs> quite in that way. <laughs> you got to pick a couple in the Land that's Cruiser. The rest are going to be driving that's separate. Right. What is the playlist of your lives? Now, this can actually be music or, you know, it could be podcasts. Or what are the things that you're consuming? And it doesn't have to be something spiritual. It can be, but it can be just for fun. Like, what are you, what's your go-to? So it's funny. I am not allowed really to have the remote control at home <laughs> because I'm terrible at it. And so if there's is a it, wait, show Is that from on, a technological standpoint? I'll explain it. So when <laughs> we are watching, let's say we watch a show, we always fast forward anything that's inappropriate in our family. So it's like, you know, we're all adults and we live in a really weird world. So there's always something, right? Yeah. And so when I have it and something happens and I'm supposed to fast forward it, do you know what happens? Slow motion. Yes. And then a pause on the worst <laughs> moment and everybody's screaming at me, get it off. And so... I'm not allowed to have the remote. So, And I actually, if I have the remote, I literally just scroll the guide. I never find anything I want to watch. So Bill is my DJ for anything that we watch on shows or whatever. I would say primarily we watch um, reality TV stuff. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I know. It's so weird. So American Idol, America's Got Talent, which I kind of hate and love that show. Something like In Our Family... When the regurgitator gets in there no, with his sword, goodbye. that's when she freaks that. out. Oh, Ew. yeah. Oh, so and we're like, get evil. it past it. Why is it sticking on this? It's so <laughs> awful. He's doing yeah, it again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. Get me out of here. Or the people that want to just scare you to death where they're climbing something so high and you're sure they're going to die uh, in front of you. So I don't enjoy that. But I do like the singers and stuff like that. But um, also, yeah, so we'll just watch reality TV show we got into um, – Married at First Sight Australia for a while. That was very interesting. The girls got me watching, um, what was that show where it's similar to Married at First Sight, but they're like, Love is Blind. Got me hooked on that last time. So those are the very godly things that I like to consume in my spare time. No, I love time. that. I also enjoy reading, but I don't love reading like real stuff. I want to read fiction. I want it to be historical fiction. I want it to be families. I want it to be somebody so happy, like immigration stories where they come from Italy. I always want them to be in Italy for a long time so I can hear all about that Yeah, and read about that. So 
I just think it's, it's funny easy. because sometimes people might see you, you know, on stage or in ministry or whatever, and just assume that you're always listening to like some pure preaching. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Well, I, All didn't, day. I didn't say that's not my story. No, I was. Yeah, I was, <laughs> we were leading up to that. Oh, I'll this tell is you, what he she watches. To. He, he listens to Adele. He loves Adele. <laughs> really? Yes. Oh, I guess I did know that. Not yeah. as much probably in the last year, but yes, we we bought a piano on Craigslist that it plays itself. And somehow I got an Adele thing where it sounds like she's on the piano, you know, <laughs> playing. And so, but I have not figured out how to use the the um, volume right on it. So it's always on loud. So, <laughs> so, if it, well, so piano, we will do the thing piano. of sitting down at the piano, making people think we're playing it, you know, because it, it does play as if, you know, the artist is there. But yes, I find that even no matter how far we go along, Adele's still good year after year when compared to get against anybody else. There are only She's certain sure ones that stand out and they are See? classic for about this. a decade, he two decades, three on. decades. <laughs> and she certainly is one of those. But, um, but yeah. I also really enjoy um, Maverick. Maverick City. City. I love gospel music. You may yeah. not know that about me. No, yeah. I shared that whole playlist with you last year. I, we were talking about that yes, C.C. Winans album. C.C. Winans. Mm-hmm. Like, I wish she would just do so much more because I feel like there's so little that she has out there for some reason, unless it's old, but fun story. Do you all, have you ever heard of Andre Crouch? I have. They're too young. This is a different world. <laughs> I know. I've, I've been experiencing this a lot in this room. I'm not even going to talk yeah, anymore. Right. I'm not going to say anything else. You have to it. realize, <laughs> I have to realize sometimes with an illustration I'll be using in the pulpit, yeah. I'll mention some show and I can tell by the looks on people's Nobody faces. Knows. There's like three people in the audience that are like, <laughs> and the rest of them are checked out, you know? I would say Andre Crouch was one of the, like, main influences for gospel music mm-hmm. over time. Like, yeah. just really, really amazing. Well, they stayed in our home. Remember I talked about how we had that dorm for yeah. the Teen Challenge? So his band came on their big tour bus and stayed at our home and wrote songs and like really wow. cool. Yeah, so it was really influential in my little brain to like, I love gospel music. So yeah. when I'm by myself, that's what I jam loud in the car. So has anybody heard of Keith Green? Keith oh, Bill, Green. So we have really a. To go so back. we're going back to the early days of Christian music. And Keith Green was a huge deal. First of all, he looked like a hippie. So people didn't know what to do with him that were not ready for that. And uh, and he had an album uh, oh, no. called No Compromise. We'll still use the word albums. Okay. It just doesn't yeah, mean still, the same thing. Yeah, it anymore. doesn't mean quite the same thing. So called No Compromise. And on the album cover, you see everybody bowing as this like pagan king goes by, you know, is being carried by and everybody's supposed to bow. And you see one person standing mm-hmm. as if I don't bow. And that was like, we all loved Keith Green immediately. And his songs were not like just enjoy the music of the song song. They were calling you to a deeper commitment. They're evangelists. But some of those songs were the early precursors of Christian music. Mm -hmm. You didn't used to hear really drums and other things to make it sound contemporary until these ones came along. Yeah. And now yeah, I'm the DJ then, for yeah. Lisa so that I will, I have all my list of Christian songs. I'll put one after another, after another. And oh, it is also he plays on our large screen TV, um, like piano music on YouTube with beautiful scenery and stuff. So it's like, it's how I go to peace. Switzerland. It's how I go to Italy. <laughs> and then Taylor's like, my brain is <laughs> No, that's right the first now. time I'm hearing about that, and that hurts. <laughs> Whenever you hear it's changed, Taylor's like, My brain's numbing. <laughs> How do you determine your direction? So, we're on a little virtual road trip here, mm-hmm. but I think a lot of us might be in a season now where maybe there's a, a life change coming up or a big decision that has to be made. And uh, over the course of your life, and now if a decision comes up, how do you decide? Or am I going right? Or am I going left? Are you using a navigator? You still got the old school map. You know, mm-hmm. this is metaphorical and it's yes, sure. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> uh, the Land Cruiser, you just put the destination <laughs> in. <laughs> and then in DC, it's like, turn right. It's like, which right? There are eight rights. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in a circle now. Lisa, help me. Yeah. I just literally, uh, two days ago, and it was like, stay in the right lane to keep left. And no. I was like, what oh, do you what? mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes no sense. Oh, no. Well, the truth is, 
going through life and looking at life now from all these years of living and, and of being in the faith and maturing through the years, through all the experiences in the faith, it comes down to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And so you cut to the quick that God is alive and well on planet Earth. Uh, the promise of the Holy Spirit has been sent to us. We can know the Holy Spirit's guidance in life, and we can have that confirmation. Now, that confirmation is all important. That's why we have a prayer life. We're, we're opening our heart to be receptive to what God would speak to us for the day before we get into the day. Emily, we talked about crew, Bill Bright. Uh, Dr. Bright was a good friend, and he started what it was known as Campus Crusade for Christ. And at one point, he said that every morning he and Vonette wake up, they get to, on the side of the bed, on their knees, and they say, no matter what is on my agenda today, God, clear it, change it, do whatever you need to do so that we're guided by you today and not simply by this incredible schedule we have that looks like we think it's you. Yeah. And that way it's somebody on the airplane that you talk to. That way it's somebody that you're walking down a hallway and you know you're supposed to go into a room uh, that you didn't realize you were ever ever going to go into, but there's a guidance there. Mm -hmm. And Bill Bright was talking in those terms of God guiding us in that way. Uh, An example of this, last Sunday we went to Coastal Flats, which is one of my favorite restaurants. Directed by the Lord, that sounds right to me. That's right. And we try to get there early (laughs) because that's the only way you can get the pasta with steak tips. If you don't get there early, it's gone. We've got to get steak tips. And we've learned we can't get steak tips on Sunday because you can't get there early enough when you're a pastor and you've got (laughs) services to conduct. Again, really matters. At any rate, so so Lisa goes to the booth to be seated and I'm going... Uh, towards the restroom, and then I think to myself, uh, "What? it just comes to me, what if I see so-and-so today in this restaurant who I haven't seen in years, how would I respond to that? And it's a person who lives in Virginia. And, and I thought, that's an unusual thought. This person hasn't been in my life in over 10 years. So went to the restroom, got to where Lisa was in the booth. She said, okay, I'll be right back. And she gets up to go. And then I look over and this guy looks up at me and takes a double take. I know he recognizes me, but I don't know who he is, but he's slightly familiar. So I get up, walk over to him. Hello, I'm Bill Schuler, And he said his name, introduced me to his wife. And I sat down. I still didn't know who he was. I wasn't putting two and two together. And then Lisa comes back and I said, Lisa, I don't know who he is but somehow I'm supposed to know him. I know he recognized me. I know I recognize him, but it's like some way back memory feel. And then I thought, it's the father of the one I thought of when I was walking into the restaurant. Oh, wow. And you wonder in those moments, what is God doing? Is it for a specific purpose? Is there a full circle moment here that we're supposed to embrace uh, in, in speaking with this person? And then he came over to our table afterwards and talked with us a bit. Again, you, there are moments where you almost say, well, what does this mean? But I believe that God is confirming that he does speak, that he does guide. And when 9-11 happened and Dr. Bright was walking through the Pentagon and the Pentagon had just been destroyed on one part of it and you could still see the whole hole there and the ash and everything, yeah. uh, there was a gentleman who got to be his guide uh, and it was the father of one of our kids' friends from the school. And he was telling the experience afterwards of what it was like to be Bill Bright's guide through the Pentagon right after 9-11, when Bill Bright was coming to comfort people who had been affected. And he said, I kept hearing him talk, and I kept saying, excuse me, what was that? And he wouldn't say it again (laughs) out loud, and he wouldn't explain. So I'm like, I don't know, but okay, we'll just keep walking. Then I hear him talking again, it happens again. And he said, I realized he was praying out loud to God and conversing in a way by which he was actually saying, we need to stop here and go into this room right now to these people right now. Now that may sound strange to some that God is that intimate with how he guides us. But I believe as you go through life, you can know when to speak, when not to speak. The Bible speaks of having the right word in the right hour. Mm -hmm. There are things to confirm what is being said here. It should never get mystical and weird, but it should be a part of our walk that we do listen to 
God and open ourselves to reset, be receptive of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the best navigation system you can ever mm-hmm. have. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I, for the longest time, used to have turn-by-turn turn, like audio on in my car, and my brother hates it. And he would get in my car like, what are you doing? Like, it would drive him crazy because it would pause the music or whatever was going on. Oh, yeah. And he was sort of accustomed to it. And I, I eventually switched over, but it took me a bit to sort of retune myself to be able to pay attention without hearing the guide all the time. And sometimes mm-hmm. I miss it. Like, I'll, mm-hmm. oh, that was my turn three turns ago. I wasn't looking. Mm-hmm. But you, if you intentionally like, okay, I'm going to purpose myself to pay attention in this certain way, yeah. mm-hmm. you're aware. Like you said, yeah. you're checking in at the beginning of the day. Mm-hmm. You're not just hopping in your car and going somewhere, but, oh, I'm actively going to look and say, where am I going? Yes. Mm-hmm. Which I think is super important. I think that's outstanding. And, and you know, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Yeah. What is meant by that? It's a guidance system that is there. And if we say, well, I'm listening for that audible voice. You mean you've heard an audible voice? I've never heard the audible voice of God. I've actually known probably three people in my life who have told me they have. And I remember stating that one time in a sermon, and I had a lady come up to me afterward and say, I have heard the audible voice of God. And so God can speak any way he wants to because he's powerful, almighty, and personal. However, there's something that is spoken of as the still small voice. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of all of the things that are happening in our lives, we want to be attuned to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We'll better understand in time what all that means. We'll grow in it. But last Sunday told me, what was that? Why was that there? Of all the people I could have thought of that we could bump into, would it really be from this family that Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about that we haven't seen in 10 years? So we're coming a little closer to the end here, and I want to leave time for question and response. But I did want to ask, and Lisa, I can ask you this too, and if you both want to respond, what do you do when your car breaks down? We all have a plan, and I would say probably for 100% of us, that plan will change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, what, do you, what do you do when something Call like that happens? Call a friend <laughs> immediately. Like I feel like um, so many times when we do break down, let's say you know you want to call it burnout, you want to call it you know, getting off the, you know, you you get get lost, you know, that yeah. if we want to go with metaphors. Yeah. Um, so many times it's because we're alone and we're most vulnerable if you're alone. And I feel like in my life, the most important times of um, safety, of coming back into a place of safety and, um, and restoration has been to surround myself with people that are trustworthy, that are godly, that know me and love me well. You know, and I think that if it's, you know, your family is a a good place to start, but if your family's not it, then making sure you do have those people around you that Mm -hmm. you can call with whatever emergency and they will come and they will help you. And of course, praying that that thing will start. (laughs) I feel like that has definitely been a story as a kid, you know praying over our cars, but I feel no, like... No, I mean, did that really happen? Because oh, that happened to us too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So many times. That's why do you think I care so much about a good car that doesn't break down <laughs> on the side of the road? No, I, <laughs> really, I remember cruel people. Yeah. I mean, my mom and my brother and I would be on the side of the road because our car broke down in California. And nobody's on the freeways. like choosing that. And people no. are like, honk, flip us off. <laughs> Get out of the road, you <laughs> idiot. And it's yeah. like, could anybody please just help? Yeah, right. And I remember those feelings and then, you know, and recognizing then I saw moments where I saw people that I respected in the Lord when I would show up and see them out there helping somebody with their vehicle. Mm -hmm. And just the Christian faith being applied is such an amazing thing and being lived out and more than just uh, believed. But yes, we have a great team. Uh, You're one of them, Jeff. And you're our emergency contact in case our house so gets glad. broken into. If anybody breaks into our house, this is the guy who shows up and takes them on. Uh, a board you of, didn't know that, but a you board are. of directors. I don't know. As soon as Ephraim arm wrestles me and wins, he might yeah, have to be your emergency be contact. But you were also like for our kids at school. Jeff was that emergency. We never had to use it, right? I no. don't think. Yeah. And but. then, and then I don't know how many of you know David King, who's in the church, and he's on our uh, board. And there was a moment in which I just said, David, I need you to clear about three hours. Or five or uh, ten. <laughs> you and I are are going to lunch. We can set the date when you can do it. And I need about three hours of your time to just pour some things out. And I need somebody who will listen and give me godly counsel in it. And he did. He just listened 98% of the time and then just was saying, listen, 
I'm, I'm praying with you. I stand with you in this. You're not alone. And we need those people that will be there in that way. Uh, I was looking at a brand new thing that came out in the news. I think I mentioned it in one of the services on Sunday that talked about pastors and a survey done as to pastor burnout and the things pastors go through. And I don't know why that would have been on the in, on one of the news pages I was looking at because it was a secular news page. But it's it's the stats are getting worse and worse for pastors as to their feeling of loneliness, as to the feeling of disrespect that they endure in not only society, but even within the church with Mm -hmm. things that happen. And I'm thinking we've had it pretty good for for the things that we've had to navigate. It's been a wonderful, healthy church for for by far the most part. But sometimes you seek to apply grace, and the other side is hitting you with how they'd hit you if it had nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with the Spirit. You're trying to respond in grace in the Spirit. Sometimes responding in grace has you, uh, for a season, feeling like the air was knocked out of you. Yeah. And uh, and yet you don't want to go into the debate where I win or you win. It's not what it's about. We want to win for the kingdom of God, and that's so. In all of that being said. You know, you really do, everybody in every profession and every stage of life, you need those people that you don't have to impress, you can be vulnerable, Mm -hmm. and they will love you completely through it and walk you through it. Yeah. And uh, so we have a great team. I think it's really helpful for all of us to see somebody that just because you have the title pastor in front of your name doesn't mean that you don't face challenges or that your car doesn't break down or that you don't have difficulties. I think the two of you are a really wonderful example of people who live with integrity. And, you know, I I know you've, uh, in the amount of time that I've known you, which has only been maybe a glimpse of your entire road trip. Um, I've gotten to see you walk that out regularly, mm-hmm. and I love and admire that about the it two of you. It was a lot of years. It well, is, yeah. <laughs> and I, and when like you're that. saying that in a general sense, I'm remem- remembering specific moments of getting on the phone with you and just saying, I, I need to talk something through. Yeah. I need to talk this through of something mm-hmm. that's coming here. And it may not be that you specifically, uniquely had anything to do with that in a specific sense. You did in a general sense. But you could be there to say, "Here, Standing I'm praying for you. you. I'm here for you. I've got, I've got this with you. You're not carrying this alone." So. And I think, and we don't need to get too much into this because I do want to get to the question and response. But um, just want to acknowledge because there's so much to your story that I feel like we can glean from. Um, what do you do when the plans change? Let me ask you this, and I think I know the answer. Have the plans changed in your mind of like your destination? Oh mm-hmm. yeah. Yes. I mean, you were going to be a Because I was going to be Amy Grant, <laughs> yeah, so obviously right. I'm not that. <laughs> I don't know if Amy Grant... Do you know Amy Grant? <laughs> okay, I don't know if Amy you. Grant wanted to be Amy Grant at times. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, but. I, I agree. I think that my idea of what I thought, and you can say different, because I think we think different, or thought differently, or think differently. We came from Tulsa, Oklahoma, where you plant a church, and it is thousands of people... Like, if we would have stayed there, it would have been the easiest thing, right? So I and thought— And part of that, so people oh, understand, we, came from a large we were ministry. chaplain of the, of the biggest Christian university in, you know, all the area. So, so if we would have announced we were starting a church, I do believe we could have had a 1,000 by the end of the year, including already... all your key positions filled because we, they would have wanted to, to be a part of that. Because of being the chaplain at the, or the yeah. campus pastor at the university yeah. and those things. And so it would have been just a really natural thing. But I still had that mentality coming here, you know, that culture of— big numbers is a success. And that's just, we know that's not how it works out here. You have 28 year olds sitting in a cubicle in Washington, DC running the world. I mean, that's really what's happening, Mm -hmm. right? We know this living here. 28 year olds, not 28 year olds. Which is a difference. Well, you know, you get 28 year olds in a room, they can really run the world. That's that's (laughs) happening in Moscow, but but we're talking about, no, I'm just kidding. Yes. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's it's just such a different culture. And yeah. so you can have so much more influence here mm-hmm. in a group that is, you know, 10 people or two people mm-hmm. than you could have in, say, Oklahoma, where we came from, yeah. and have 10,000 people in a room. And it's not one better than the other. Right. It's just so different. Yeah. So to me, I always, I you know, I struggled for so many years thinking, why isn't this growing? And then God gives us this building, which is such a huge, huge blessing to have a parking lot. And we know this here, but in my mind, I'm still thinking, God, why are you giving us this little building with this little parking lot? What are you thinking? That is not going to reach the world. But 
it is reaching the world yeah. and it is making that impact and you guys are making that I was impact. Say it's through you. You have it's the influence you. of thousands mm -hmm. based on what you think might be your little job, but your your job here translates so much it's bigger. It's ripple effects. Yeah. yeah. So I think that to me is is probably the biggest culture change, mindset change, all of it. I remember we were in the car with this young guy when we were we were kind of scouting out the land and he was hosting us when for we some very reason. First were I can't remember out. his name. I don't remember anything about him except that I really thought he was a great guy. We really enjoyed being with him. And one question he asked us in our conversation was, why do you think everything has to be so big? And I was like, what? I didn't even think that we were talking like that, but yeah. we came from Tulsa, yeah. Oklahoma. That's just how you thought was like, we're going to do something great and big. Well, and what was on the desk of our us. university president and founder was make no small plans here. That's what it said on his desk. So, so we, we thought we weren't supposed to make small plans. We're supposed to win the world. We also thought that big plans meant a lot of numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we found it. It's more in being faithful and that God will, through your faithfulness, start these ripple effects we're talking about. Yeah. But I, I don't know if this will sound strange, but I found that God sometimes baits and switches. Now, that may sound strange, but with us coming out here, we thought we perhaps were going to start and launch a dream center. And maybe you don't know, have, have heard of that, but in Los Angeles, there's something called the Dream Center, and it picks up people off the streets, and it, you know, rescues the prostitutes, it, it, uh, Gang you know, it, it brings transformed. in people that are, wouldn't have a place to live and puts them in, in the old Queen of Angels Hospital. It used to be one of the two premier hospitals in, in Los Angeles history, and they, and now it's a Christian organization and all this. And the head of all that said, could you guys be, uh, the um, national head uh, quarters leaders of the dream centers of America as you're going to Washington, D.C. So when we first started out here, we were looking at multi-million dollar buildings, thinking on the scale of what he was yeah. talking about. Only he was inspiring. He wasn't putting money behind any of it. <laughs> and so we were asking our real estate agent to go into parts of the city. The real estate agent said, I will not go there. And it's not safe. And we're like, but it's affordable. Yeah. <laughs> could you bring us at least close to where we could walk to where we can get to see this place where it's still a boiler that's making everything mm -hmm. happen and similar to what this building used to be. But, but uh, And so there was a bait and switch when we realized that I went to the, um, to the mayor's office, spoke with the person I thought was the strategic person to help us be in the inner city and make these things happen for a dream center. And after I spoke with him for a bit, he said, there's just one problem. And I said, what's that? He said, you're the wrong color. It'll never work. And that could have just completely wiped me out. Mm -hmm. But instead, I found myself walking out and thinking, well... God brought us here. He's going to show us how it's going to work. Right. So I called the head of the Dream Center stuff, a man by the name of Tommy Barnett, who's a dear friend and mentor and pastor of a huge church in Phoenix. I think he's retired now, but, but in those days I was very much in touch with him. And I said, the ones coming to our Bible studies are from the George W. Bush White House. I don't know how that happened, but we've got all these leaders from the White House. Oh, well, we knew how it happened, but the amount of people, ones we were getting was amazing to us. And we said, but we don't have any open doors yet in the inner city. He said, go with what God has opened the door for. He will open the door for all that he wants you to do in right timing. That's great. So focus in. And that's what we did. And now we have ministry that's not only, you know, it's all the way from those that are in the White House and on the Hill and those things to the vulnerable, to the international and to all generations. I mean, it's been amazing to see what happens when we come into this church. You know how this church looks Right now, we have the world together here. Yeah. And there are people that come into churches and all they see is one color and one culture, and that is not heaven. Mm -hmm. And so we have something very special and very unique, and we want to continue to see that thrive. And that's by just promoting what Jesus is all about. Yeah, and you never would have expected it. Wouldn't have expected it, bait and switch. <laughs> well, that was just the best. Since that week, 16 years ago on the beach to today, they are still some of the most relational people I know, passionate not just about ministry, but about people. 
and it's always fun to get them in a room and hear some of their stories. Some of those I hadn't even heard before. It was really great. And I'm looking forward to our next episode, which is going to be the Q&R time. And there were some great questions that were asked. I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. Stay tuned to the podcast feed. And then we've already recorded our next episode. The next person we've got coming into the C3 Garage has been at Capital Life Church longer than Capital Life Church has been at Capital Life Church. It's a mind-bending riddle, I know, but stay tuned and you're going to find out who our next interviewee is. He wears a lot of hats here. Maybe he's worn almost all the hats. 90% of the hats at Capital Life Church he has probably worn, and I'm excited to hear his story. So stay tuned to the podcast feed, and if you can, join us in person. Again, capitallife.org slash C3, and you can find our full schedule there. Look forward to seeing you next time at Where the Rubber Meets the Road.